Well, full disclosure, as Jay said, I was pretty sick last week. It's not COVID, so please don't come at me with your peppermint oil up my nose. I don't need it. I'm perfectly fine. But it is funny now that like, if anything's not COVID, we're just grateful. Like I had pneumonia and I was like, thank you, Jesus. Yes, God, you're good. i um, just so glad it, it wasn't COVID. Um, anyways, all that to say, I am absolutely hopped up on antibiotics and prednisone and albuterol, all the great stuff right now. So I feel Two thumbs up. It's, it's great to be here today. Um, so for those of you guys that may not know, my name is Taylor Clayton, and I have the privilege of being the youth director here at Simple Church, which means that I get to hang out with some of our really awesome teens here on Wednesday nights, and I get to communicate with them throughout the week. And man, not all of them are here, but these guys are just the, the light of my life. I love them. They're hilarious. They're awesome. They are wonderful. We do this fun thing. Please participate, because if you don't, that'd be really embarrassing. Baba Booey. Yes, thank goodness. If they wouldn't have said that, that would have been so embarrassing. But man, these guys are just awesome. I absolutely adore them. Um, and if you have a teen, count yourself lucky because they are just, they're such wonderful people. They're so great and I adore you guys. Sorry, I just got to brag about you for a minute. Um, but being up here with you guys is definitely different because you're like, all adults and that's really weird and it's funny because sometimes like my mom will like make a joke like why are all your friends 13 and I'm like that's not true I hang out with Jay sometimes so ha. Um, it is really weird though because my friends are either like married with children and a mortgage or like still buying three ring binders I don't know it's <laughs> it's a weird time in my life but if you've been with us for these past few weeks man we have just been going through the story of Joseph and that poor son of a gun and all of the things in his life. Um, the story is found in the book of Genesis, and obviously Joseph's story, and obviously is, is part of a much larger story, more directly related to God's promise to Abraham that he was going to bless his lineage and, and they would be a blessing to the, all nations. Um, but today I really want to kind of hone in on a certain section of Joseph's story. Last week, uh, we left off kind of where Joseph was in prison. So if you guys haven't been with us, I just kind of want to catch you up at where we are at at this point in the story. But before we really get into this, um, I kind of want to preface this whole thing with something, is whenever we hear these stories, specifically like stories from the Old Testament, like I know David and Goliath is a big one that kind of gets this of, we read the story and we think, okay, so what does that mean about me? What, is, what does that mean for me? What does that say about me? And today with, with this story specifically, rather than just relating it directly to ourselves, the way that I really want us to look at it is through the lens of what does this story say about God, about God's heart, about God's plans for us, and in turn, what does that mean for me? So to kind of catch you guys up on the story of Joseph, for those of you that may not know, uh, Joseph was the 11th of 12 sons and some number of daughters, we don't know exactly, of a man named Jacob. And so uh, Joseph was very obviously the favorite child. Like not in a subtle way, because I don't have children, obviously, but I'd be willing to bet Sometimes you don't have to admit it or like nod your head or give me a little, you know, but sometimes you prefer one of your children over the other. Sometimes maybe like you can be honest. It's okay. My parents are sitting right there. I know I was always your favorite growing up, but the, everyone's different. It's not important, but let's be honest. Sometimes maybe you feel that way, but here's the thing. Joseph was very obviously the favorite like to, like his dad like gave him like a, a rainbow coat and like he was like it was weird and and he would like worship the ground that Joseph walked on anyways obviously Joseph's brothers were not crazy about this which is fair I don't blame them and so their solution to this whole crazy situation is let's kill him <laughs> whoa that's a little far one of the brothers Reuben was like hey that's that's a little much. Let's, let's reel it back and let's just sell him into slavery because that's somehow moralistically okay. But killing him is not, I don't know, that doesn't make any sense to me. So they sell him into slavery. He goes to Egypt because God was working in Joseph's life and he was doing amazing things. Joseph rose kind of second in rank in the house of Potiphar, who was a very influential figure in Egypt. And then Potiphar's wife accused Joseph of assault. He was thrown into prison. And that's kind of where we left off last week. 
So Joseph, he's had a bit of a rough running, I would say, maybe not ideal. Um, but where we left off, Joseph's in prison. And whenever he's in prison, he kind of almost rises to this position of, it's definitely a position of influence, maybe kind of like a guard. Um, but that's where we picked up this week. And so now the story kind of jumps to Pharaoh, who is the king of Egypt. And the king of Egypt has tons of servants, as you might expect. He has these two specific servants that are his cupbearer and his baker. And apparently they did something to tick him off. We don't really know. But basically Pharaoh sends them into the custody of the same people that Joseph is working with. So they're kind of all in prison together. So Joseph is in prison with the cupbearer and the baker. And then we pick up our story in Genesis chapter 40, verse 5. And it says, in one night, they both dreamed, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt who were confined in prison, each his own dream and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in his master's house, why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, we have had dreams and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Please, tell them to me. So the story continues, and the cupbearer tells Joseph about his dream. And, and it's just, it's a little bit weird. Like, all these are very metaphorical dreams. But basically, Joseph was like, dude, you just hit the jackpot. You may be in prison right now, but give it three days, and Pharaoh is going to lift up your head, and you are going to be restored in your position as chief cupbearer. Now that I gave you this good fortune, whenever you get there, whenever you're restored to your rank, please remember me. The cupbearer is like, awesome. That sounds great. I swear I will lie. And then the baker overhears this conversation and he's like, oh, that sounds awesome. Like I want, I want in on that. So the baker obviously had a dream as well. And the baker shares this dream with Joseph. And Joseph is like, uh, well, um, here's the thing. So basically what this dream means is that Pharaoh is also going to rise up your head, but it's it's because he's going to hang you on a tree. So you're going to die, um, which is not great. And I'm sorry. <laughs> so two very different dream interpretations. But anyways, Joseph gives them these interpretations. A couple days pass. Pharaoh is throwing this huge party at his house for all of his servants. And exactly what Joseph said would come true came true. The cupbearer is restored to his rank. And of course, forgets Joseph because he's a liar, apparently. I don't know. And then the baker, he's gone, but Joseph was correct. So the cupbearer is back in his position, and now the story jumps to two years later, and we're back with Pharaoh again. And Pharaoh has been having some bad dreams. And call them dreams, nightmares, prophecies, whatever you want to call them. But they are a little bit creepy. I'll be honest, they sound really weird. They both obviously kind of have the same message to them, but there's two dreams. The first one, it's the seven fat, healthy calves coming out of the water. And then after them come seven skinny, gross looking calves and they eat the fat calves, which is weird in and of itself. And then the second dream has to do with seven healthy ears of grain that are eaten up by seven scraggly dead pieces of grain. So in my head, Pharaoh's like waking up in a cold sweat and he's like, oh my God, what does this mean? And he's like super nervous. And so basically what he does is he calls the fortune tellers, wizards, magicians, every translation says something different. Basically the fortune tellers of the time and all the wise men of the country to come and interpret this dream because he's very clearly freaked out about it and he has no idea what it means. So all these people show up and no one can tell him what the dream means. Absolutely zero people. So Pharaoh's very frustrated. And the cupbearer is like, oh, oh yeah. So <laughs> remember a couple years ago when I was in prison, um, there was this guy who I had a weird dream and he told me what it meant and it came true. And in my mind, Pharaoh's probably like, you're an idiot. Why didn't you tell me this earlier? And so we pick back up at this point in Genesis 41 verse 14. It says, then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream and there is no one who can interpret it. I've heard it said of you that when the, you hear a dream, 
you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. So then Pharaoh shares his dream with Joseph and Joseph interprets the dream for him. And basically, long story short, what Joseph tells Pharaoh is that the, the land of Egypt and surrounding areas are going to have seven years of abundance, of blessings, of all the supplies that they're going to need. They're going to have way more than they are going to need for seven years. And then the seven years following that are going to be seven years of famine, of hard times, and of lack. So Pharaoh freaks out about this. Rightfully, he's a little bit nervous. And so essentially, he appoints Joseph to kind of be in command of stockpiling things and putting things away to make sure they have enough to make it through the seven years of famine. And all is good. And then the story continues a little bit, as Jay is going to talk about next week. But essentially, all that God has promised Joseph or all that God has spoken over Joseph comes true. And it all comes to pass. And the things that God has promised have still stood. Now, with this story, there are a lot of things that you can pull from it. A lot of people will say a lot of different things that they learned from this story. That's why the process of exegeting is so difficult. But there are two things from this story that I, I really want us to kind of hone in on. I, we've probably heard this message preached a few times, and I've heard it preached a lot of different ways. But for some reason this time, God really really hit me in the face with this one. And, and there are two specific things that I want us to pull from this story. First, as we'll see next week that I mentioned, Jay's going to talk about, you know, the things that God spoke over Joseph came to pass. And God was keeping his, his promise to Abraham. And, and throughout this whole story, God's just keeping his promises. But the thing is, God was keeping his promises and things were working out, but things did not look the way that anyone thought they were going to. Even though God was working, even though God was fulfilling his promises, things didn't look the way they were expected to. And I think this is a pretty big deal because God's promise still stood, but the circumstances were just really, really odd for God to be fulfilling his promise through that situation. And I mean, here's the thing, Joseph still had all of his giftings whenever he was going through everything. Obviously, we see that he can interpret dreams and, and he is in God's favor. Joseph still had all those things and God was fulfilling his promises. But I don't know about you guys, but if I had a dream, like we talked about one of the first weeks of, you know, I was going to be bowed down to basically insinuating that Joseph was going to be some kind of a king or an influential figure if, if I was under the impression that that was going to happen and I ended up being nearly killed, sold into slavery, accused, and then thrown into prison, I'd be like, well, that wasn't true. <laughs> that did not sound right. Because, I mean, honestly, I'm, I'd be willing to bet that Joseph was very, very, very confused by his circumstances. Because what God had promised didn't necessarily reflect what he was experiencing. But the big thing is that I think we can pull from this story is that God is still working in ways that we don't expect him to. Because does anyone know that God doesn't always do exactly what we want of him? Are you guys aware of that? I'm so sorry if I just bursted your bubble. But we're not going to get what we want all the time. Because fun fact, we think we know what we want but God knows what we actually need, even if we neglect to understand why. Because has anyone in here actually ever had everything turn out exactly the way they expected it to? If you did, please raise your hand. Good, because everyone would have hated you for that. Because the thing is, we don't always get what we want. Things don't always turn out the way that we expect them to. But the thing is, God knows what he is doing. God knew what he was doing when Joseph's brothers were about to murder him. God knew what he was doing when he was sold into slavery. God knew what he was doing when he was being accused. And God knew what he was doing when Joseph was in prison. Why all those things had to happen the way that they did, that totally beats me. I have 
no idea why, which I'm sure most you can say the same for just your life. <laughs> Whenever things are working out a certain way, you don't know why they're working out that way. But obviously God knew what he was up to because things worked out, right? I mean, things worked out for Joseph. Things worked out through Abraham's lineage to bring Jesus. Obviously, God had some sort of idea of the way that he was going to handle that situation. And if God promises us something, God is a man of his word, and we can trust that it is going to come to pass, but that does not necessarily mean that it is going to work out or look the way that we thought it would. It doesn't always necessarily mean it's going to meet our expectations because God's, God's expectations are greater. And here's the problem that we face sometimes, kind of the way that I see it, is sometimes we are on our way to a promise. We are on our way to things actually working out. We are on our way to what God has given us, and we throw in the towel. We give up, we get mad at God because we think, God, what you're giving me is not good enough. And, and when we do that sometimes, even if our circumstances are bad, we totally miss the life around us. We totally miss whatever it is that God is trying to do through us. And we don't necessarily know why we have to go through these things to get what God has promised us. But because we're so mad that things don't meet our expectations that we think that God is no longer working because we think we know what needs to happen. And just like how Joseph was integral to God's will and God's story that would eventually lead up to Jesus, we get to choose to be willing to be a part of God's plan. Obviously, ultimately, that plan is to be unified with him in whatever form that looks like, in whatever vocation it is that we have in this world. We get the chance to choose to be a part of God's plan. Now, that's the second thing that I want us to focus on from the story is that Joseph was willing to be a part of God's story. We can very clearly find hope in the fact that God is, is working things out, right? Obviously, God knows what he's doing. God is, is making a way. He is laying things out. And, and if he has promised us something, he's working up to it. And we can find hope and comfort in the fact that God knows what he's doing. However, there comes a point where if God is laying out the path to the promise, we have to take that step. We have to be willing to listen, listen to God's voice, to understand that he knows what he's doing. And that's what I really love about the way that Joseph handles the situation. Because let's be honest, he has been through it. And I'm sure at this point, he was probably pretty fed up with his circumstances. I know for me personally, um, something happened recently that kind of, not necessarily broke my heart, but definitely hit me in the face and made me realize that the, the path that I'm walking now, the path that God has set me on, was not at all my expectation. For those of you guys that maybe don't know, um, I went to school in Edmond, to Oklahoma Christian University, and started out a psych major, became a youth ministry major. That happens, and in my head, I'm like, great, I got three more years of school, I'm going to do a couple internships, become da, da, da. and I had everything mapped out. And this was March of 2020, weird time, right? Um, and by November of 2020, somehow I was working at Simple Church, and that's not a bad thing. Obvious, Jay, this is not a bad thing. I love working here. Please don't. And I love you guys. Don't take this the wrong way. Um, but I was realizing that all the things that I had wanted and, and all the things between then and now, nothing turned out the way I really wanted it to and nothing turned out the way I expected it to. And clearly... To some extent, I'm on, I'm on the road to God's promise, and that's fantastic. But I've been still grieving the fact that just because God has promised me something doesn't mean I'm going to get what I want. And I think we all know that, but maybe subconsciously we don't really accept it. 
because we think that things are going to have to turn out a certain way or it has to go our way or it has to go the way that we expect for things to be good because if God promises something, we think there has to be point A, B, and C exactly the way we expect to get there and obviously that's not always the case because in my opinion, on the road to get where Joseph was, most people wouldn't guess that it entails being sold into slavery and being accused and being thrown into prison. Most people wouldn't guess that that's what that entails. But what I love, again, about the way that Joseph handled the situation is he trusted that God's promise was true and it was good and God was not going to fail him just because things didn't look the way that Joseph thought they were going to. However, this isn't some kind of like uh, prosperity gospel, let me just say that. It's not me saying like, oh, if you walk down God's magic yellow brick road, then you'll never have any troubles and you'll get a Lambo and you'll have Instagram followers and your kids will never punch each other in the face and you'll live happily ever after. That's not how it works. Um, if you read like one story in the Bible, you know that sometimes Jesus followers have a hard time. <laughs> I do know that God wants us to have life and life abundantly, but God's plan for us is so much more than just what we experience here and just, just the things that we get here. Because like I mentioned earlier, God's plan is unity with him. And, and that's the road that we're ultimately walking down. And it leads to certain different checkpoints of what God's blessing us with or what God has promised us with. Because obviously, God's end goal with Joseph wasn't just for him to, you know, be in command in Egypt. That obviously wasn't his very end goal. But the thing is, for us to get to that place, for us to get to whatever it is that we believe that God has promised us, we have to be willing to follow, just like Joseph did. Because I can bet he was downright disappointed with everything going on. But to get through the mess of everything that happened, to get to where God wants him to be, he had to follow God. That is the only way. To trust that he can follow God's spirit and he can listen to his voice to get to that point. And here's a, a little bit of a metaphor that when it comes to the idea of hitting the mark or, or making it to where God wants us to be, I think illustrates it very well. And I'll be honest, it's a little bit cheesy, um, but it's a story whenever I was serving at another church that we taught in kids' church. And it's for children, but I think adults definitely need to hear it more than children. <laughs> so essentially what it was, was it was kind of like pin the tail on the donkey for the most part. We had a target up on the wall, and we took one of the little like three-year-old kids, and we blindfolded them, and we gave them a sticker, and spun them round and round and round and round, and their goal was to hit a mark to hit a certain point, to reach a certain goal. But the thing was, no one could help them. And they were, they were dizzy and blindfolded, and 100% of the time, when they tried to do it by themselves, they missed terribly. To be fair, they were like three and they had no fine motor skills. However, that is not the point. They completely missed. And then, we did it again. We gave them a sticker, they were blindfolded, spun around and around and around. Nothing about their circumstances changed. But the difference was I, as the teacher, who could see the target, who could see the point they were supposed to be hitting, who could see the whole picture, had the opportunity to instruct them how to get there. And when they listened to the person who could see the whole picture, they hit the mark every single time. Now again, that's maybe a little bit cheesy, but... I think that speaks volumes about the power of what can happen when we are willing to let someone who can see the whole picture, which there's only one, <laughs> lead us, we're bound to hit the mark. Even if the dizziness and the confusion and the circumstances don't change, it's going to lead us to the right point. I really love what Paul says in Galatians 6, 9, and Paul's just an awesome dude. He really knew what he was talking about. But what he says is, let us not become weary in doing good, or let us not become weary in chasing after what God has called us to do, or the promises that God has given us, or pursuing him. For at the proper time, 
Notice he doesn't say when we want it or when we think it's right or when we think it's going to best work out or whenever we've decided is, is the right time for this certain thing. At the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. That is so powerful. I think this applies so perfectly to just Joseph's experience. Because if he had given up following God, which this is not to shame anyone who feels like giving up because believe me, we all do. I'm certain Joseph did. But if he had given up in the middle of his mess because what he was feeling or the things that he was experiencing did not line up with his expectations for God's promise, he wouldn't have gotten to God's promise. Because even in prison, Joseph was working towards what God wanted him to do, which could not have been easy. And it's not easy for us. In the middle of our messiest, most problematic circumstances, it's not easy to continue using our gifts or to continue leaning into the, the promise that God has given us. Be like, well, I, I guess God, let's go for it. I mean, I'll be honest, it's been really difficult for me at times just to trust that I'm, I'm doing exactly what God wants me to do because it doesn't line up with my expectations. And there have been times in my life where I've been confused with something and I, and I wish it hadn't happened, but it got me to where God wanted me to be. And sometimes that's just the lens we have to see circumstances through because I'll be honest, there are gonna be things that happen to us that we are never going to really understand why. So thankfully, sometimes God will kind of give us a little bit of that, that revelation of like, there have been things that I walked through that got me exactly where I needed to be. And that is awesome because there have been experiences that taught me things that I never would have learned otherwise. But there are going to be times where we're just straight up confused because we are quite a few centuries removed from Joseph's story. And some of the things that happened to him, it's easy to be like, couldn't there have been another way? Like, did he really have to go through all of that? And for us, it's probably still going to feel that same way sometimes. No matter how far we remove ourselves, or especially if you're a feeler, if you're a feeler over a thinker, looking at something and when something doesn't meet your expectations of the way you thought it would feel or the way you would experience it, that hurts. And no matter how far we remove ourselves sometimes, we might still be confused. And that's okay. That's perfectly fine. Because... Obviously, God knows exactly what he's doing. And that is the most peaceful understanding we can possibly receive, is even though things aren't gonna always look the way we want them to, or it's not always what we would have chosen, God's got it. God has it under control because ultimately our goal is not just what we get here in this life. Our goal is not just if we get the job or we, we get that relationship or, or we get that education. That's not the goal. <laughs> the goal is unity with God. And if we trust that everything that God is, is working out is for that, we're going to be A-OK. -okay. And if we trust that we can follow his spirit to that point and let God lead us and say, God, I don't know why what's going on is going on, but I know you've got it. That puts us in a way better position than just thinking that what we have planned is better. So we're going to have our band come back on stage and we're going to sing a new song. And I'll be honest, this is pretty much my favorite song of all time. And it just talks about the power of, of God's leadership in our lives. And it, it is a worship song. It talks about how powerful God is and how all-knowing and his leadership but somehow even more than that, it's, it's a cry and it's a prayer and it's begging God that, Lord, I don't understand. I don't get why what's happening to me is happening to me and this really hurts. But I trust that even in my mess, even in my worst possible circumstances, if I follow you, things will be okay. So church, let's pray. Dear Lord, today, I thank you for, for your word and for your truth. I thank you for your promises and your provision. 
And Lord, today, I pray that you would just give us the confidence and the bravery to say genuinely, God, wherever it is you want me to go, I am in. And no matter what I experience, no matter what I feel, this is my submission. And this is a cup you have for me. And even when I am confused, God, I want you to lead me and be the Lord over my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.